All right. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so osteomyelitis is relatively common. About one in 5,000 children under the age of 13 um, uh, will present with this at some point. The mean age is around six years, and typically this occurs uh, via hematogenous uh, spread. So we all have some bacteria that floats through our bodies. Um, this is not uncommon in healthy children. So this is one difference between the infections that you see in adults and the infections that you see in uh, pediatrics is that Typically, these are not uh, immunocompromised um, individuals. So one thing to keep in mind is that the mechanism for this is typically some local trauma creates a small hematoma, and that sets up an opportunity for the bacteremia that we all have uh, flowing uh, through us to uh, set up shop and develop a more significant infection. So if you remember nothing else from this webinar, if you think about the fact that a history of trauma doesn't mean they don't also have an infection, in fact, it makes it more likely you will probably save someone's life um, by being cognizant of that fact. Unfortunately, most of us in peds have taken care of somebody who had a mild fracture uh, that developed a sub significant severe infection around that um, that was complaining of atypical pain. Um, and so just keep in mind, if you see somebody with a buckle fracture and they're immobilized, they should be pretty comfortable following that. And if they're not, keep your uh, radar up for the possibility of infection, and uh, it'll be a clinical opportunity to have a big win. Okay, so some questions. In children, a diagnosis of osteomyelitis with concomitant DVT has a high association, high association with which causative organism? So that's going to be uh, MRSA. Um, so uh, anytime you're taking care of somebody with MRSA, uh, keep in mind the possibility of a DVT. So overall, Staph aureus is going to be the most common organism in all children, and uh, there are community-acquired MRSA, um, and these uh, strains oftentimes have this PVL. Um, if they're PVL positive, that tends to be associated with more complex infections. And again, kind of can't stress this enough because it's clinically important as well as being highly tested. Uh, MRSA is associated with increased risk of DVT. Next question. So a six-year-old boy develops tenderness at the right heel and avoids putting weight on the right extremity after stepping on a nail. Calcaneo osteomyelitis caused by a puncture wound has an increased rate of which of the following organisms? So um, we have uh, the option choices seen uh, there, group A, streptococcus, coliforms infection, haemophilus, pseudomonas, or group B, strep. So, uh, as I'm sure you all knew, um, this is a pseudomonas infection. Uh, so whenever it's a direct puncture wound uh, to the foot, I think about it being uh, pseudomonas as uh, a highly likely suspect. So uh, some subgroups that have uh, different types of pathophysiology that's more common. The um, group B strep is seen more often in neonates. Kingella is seen commonly in young age groups, pseudomonas with direct puncture wounds, and then uh, haemophilus. We don't see as much uh, since the advent of the vaccine, but can still occur, particularly in those that don't vaccinate. Another possibility, um, particularly if you're in a region like we are, where you get a lot of international uh, uh, travel, uh, that uh, TB can be uh, something you want to consider. And if you're thinking about that as a possibility, uh, then you want to make sure that the uh, stains are done for the acid fast bacilli. And then in the sickle cell population, salmonella infections are common. So acute osteomyelitis, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, usually uh, these cases are uh, hematogenous in origin, uh, so you get some initial bacteremia, um, and then uh, because there's this sluggish blood flow through the metaphyseal region uh, around the physis, uh, there's this sharp turn uh, that many of those blood vessels are making that allows the bacteria to have an opportunity. So that's one of the uh, things that predisposes children uh, to getting severe infections that uh, they won't have later on in life. So uh, subsequent to this, uh, a subperiosteal abscess can develop when the purulence uh, through the metaphyseal region breaks through the cortex, and these kids can get particularly sick. 
Another possibility is a septic arthritis can occur because uh, in four joints, there's intraarticular metaphyseal cortex. So these four joints, and it's important to know, again, for tests and for uh, clinical relevance, are the hip, the shoulder, the elbow, and the ankle. Another subgroup you want to be particularly careful with is the infants less than one year of age, because these uh, children can oftentimes have infection that spreads across their uh, growth plate and uh, causes both osteomyelitis um, uh, and septic arthritis. Just think of kids that are uh, super young as basically being petri dishes. So when you find one area that's infected, you want to check their whole body for anything else that's uh, suspicious, because frequently you'll find another uh, location of infection. Chronic osteo uh, is a little bit different, um, and we'll uh, show in the subsequent slide uh, what a sequestrum and involucrum looks like. But you also get these chronic abscesses uh, where uh, they're surrounded by sclerotic bone and then fibrous uh, tissue, and that leads to what we know as the Brody's abscesses. So a sequestrum is defined as which of the following? Number one, reactive bone and acute osteomyelitis. Number two, reactive bone and chronic osteomyelitis. Number three, necrotic bone providing a nidus for infection in chronic osteomyelitis, or healthy bone adjacent to chronic osteomyelitis, or healthy bone adjacent to acute osteomyelitis. So that's going to be number three, necrotic bone providing a nidus for infection. So here's a picture format of what we're uh, thinking about. So you have this uh, area here um, that is um, uh, the sequestrum. This is the area of necrotic bone uh, that's become walled off from its blood supply. And around this area, you have a layer of new bone growth, which is known as the involucrum. So the involucrum is actually on the outside, um, and the sequestrum is within it, that necrotic area of bone. The mortality, fortunately, with antibiotic treatment has decreased from 50% to less than 1%, but it certainly can happen. And again, usually in the cases where it happens, it's because somebody, someone wasn't thinking about the diagnosis, um, and uh, it, it got too far along before intervention. So the presentation is typically going to be one of uh, pain in the extremity. There's usually uh, some history of uh, remote minor trauma, uh, another uh, thing to consider is whether or not they've been immunized. And keep in mind that if they've had antibiotic use, it may make the uh, symptoms more subtle. Typically, they're going to limp or refuse to bear weight. And generally, they're not very ill-appearing at the uh, start, although they can certainly become that way. And then uh, fevers are oftentimes uh, present, but not always. Uh, on exam, you're going to have restricted range of motion due to pain. So this was a study looking at uh, patient factors by Jew, and uh, they identified four patient factors for identifying between uh, MRSA and MSSA, and those were a temperature greater than 38, a white blood cell count more than 12,000, a hematocrit less than 34, and a CRP greater than 13. If you have all four of those, you have a 92% chance of having an MRSA infection. If you have three out of four, you have a 42%. So if you fall in either of those groups, you should uh, probably um, include MRSA coverage in your antibiotic selection. So next question, a five-year-old boy presents with a uh, temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit and painful weight bearing on the left lower extremity for one day. His hip motion is painless, but his knee motion is painful. Um, he uh, has a white blood cell count of 21,000, CRP of 72, an aspirate of the knees performed that's unremarkable. Um, so we're going to see some images that after being treated for this condition, what study will be needed in late-term follow-up if clinically indicated. So we have standing full-length films, MRI of the hip, MRI of the femur, uh, PET scan, and parathyroid hormones. And the images uh, here show some uh, osteo of the distal femur and associated um, uh, infection in the soft tissue. And so in this case, you're going to want to monitor for growth arrest. So you want to get a standing full-length film of his bilateral lower extremities uh, to make sure that you don't miss limb length inequality. So uh, standard imaging to start with is going to be, uh, of course, 
start with a plain radiograph. Sometimes this is going to answer the question, as uh, you can see here, this example of Brody's abscess. Um, but also know that early films may be normal, um, <clears throat> and oftentimes the effects that you see on uh, x-ray are going to lag behind what's actually occurring. So when you get late films at one to two weeks after the initial diagnosis, those oftentimes show more uh, change in the bone. And oftentimes the x-ray, uh, when you first treat it, looks great. And the x-ray two weeks later looks uh, terrible. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, CT uh, can be used in some uh, chronic cases to assess uh, things like an involucrum or sequestrum. Um, but um, typically, uh, if you're trying to catch things early, uh, an MRI is going to be your most sensitive uh, test. Um, and this is increased if you use gadolinium. Uh, bone scans, we don't use too many bone scans for a diagnosis of osteo, um, but there are a few cases where it can be really clinically helpful, and that would be in particular if you have an infant or toddler with a non-focal exam and you're really having a hard time pinning things down, a bone scan is a good way to narrow in on one particular area because you can't have them in the MRI scanner and just do their entire body. Okay. So in terms of labs, your CRP is going to be your most uh, valuable uh, thing to follow here. So white blood cell count is not even uh, always elevated uh, when you're taking care of patients with um, uh, osteomyelitis, though it certainly can be. Uh, but your CRP is, uh, with very rare exception, going to be elevated. Um, it becomes elevated very quickly, and it's also the most sensitive to monitor your therapeutic response. So it's the best indicator of your early treatment um, being effective. It's most uh, sensitive uh, to detect an infection in the first place. ESR is usually uh, elevated and uh, can rise rapidly, but the problem is it goes down uh, quite slowly, so it's hard to gauge whether or not things are responding appropriate to your uh, either surgical or antibiotic treatment or both. And then uh, procalcitonin is something that's uh, becoming a little bit um, of a newer uh, test, but as you can see, the sensitivity on this isn't that great, so it's about 60%. Bone aspirations uh, it can help uh, if you're just in search of a definitive uh, diagnosis. Blood cultures are going to be positive in less than 50%, but it's a good thing to check before they get antibiotics um, because it may give you uh, an organism that you can target narrowly without uh, having to do a further biopsy. Um, again, aspiration can assist in diagnosis and management. Um, we don't always a biopsy. Oftentimes, they'll be treated empirically. But if the diagnosis isn't clear or you're not responding uh, appropriately to the antibiotic, uh, uh, the frontline agents, then it's uh, certainly a good thing to consider. Keep in mind that in many cases, you also want to rule out malignancy if there's any suspicion for that. So just in general, it's good uh, if you're uh, taking an intraoperative uh, biopsy to culture all tumors um, and uh, send all infections for path. And then the uh, clinical picture is really clear. That may not be indicated, but it's something to consider when it's fuzzy. So uh, antibiotic uh, therapy alone is typically the front line if it's early disease with no associated abscess. Um, but if it's not uh, improving clinically, then uh, there's a low threshold for surgical intervention as well. Uh, okay, next question. An eight-year-old girl presents to the ER with a four-day history of a limp. Lab results show white blood cell count of 13,000. Her CRP is elevated at 14. Um, during the workup in the ER, the patient becomes hypotensive. Uh, what is the um, mechanism of action of the empiric antibiotic appropriate for this patient? So um, we have... Uh, concerning situation here that she's uh, becoming uh, hypotensive um, and ill in front of us. So we want to make sure that we have good uh, coverage for MRSA, which is typically the culprit when uh, kids get really sick like that. And so uh, you want the mechanism of action of vancomycin, which is going to be number two, binding to the d ala d ala residues. So uh, again, typically we begin with empiric therapy. Uh, if there's a high suspicion for MRSA, then we would cover for vancomycin. Otherwise, it'd be um, either nafcillin or oxacillin. And if there's uh, anything suspicious on the gram stain for a gram-negative bacilli, uh, then we'd add a third-generation cephalosporin. Uh, 
Again, here, uh, timing uh, is a little bit debatable. So we typically uh, treat with IV antibiotics for four to six weeks, but that's a very controversial uh, duration. And if you can identify the specific organism, then you can oftentimes narrow the antibiotic coverage. Okay, a nine-year-old boy was placed in a short leg splint in an ER after twisting his ankle, so small trauma. Ten days later, he has worsening pain and fevers um, over the last uh, three days. His CRP is now 12, ESR is 38. MRI images uh, are going to be shown. What is the next step in management? Irrigation debridement of the distal fibula osteomyelitis, short leg walking cast, oral antibiotics stress radiographs or lace up ankle brace and functional rehab. So um, you can uh, see here that you have this elevation of the periosteum. Again, this is a kid that had a small amount of trauma, but now an infection that set up shop. And this is the kind of thing that doesn't uh, typically respond to just antibiotics alone well. So you would want to IND the distal fibula uh, physis, or the distal fibula metaphysis um, to try to, to uh, prevent from worsening involving the physis um, and get the osteomyelitis under control. Okay, a 22-month-old female is hospitalized with a fever and malaise. Uh, she's bacteremic and uh, growing MSSA. Her arm is slightly swollen and appears painful to use. MRI shows the following. Um, which feature of the MRI suggests the need for surgical management? So we can see here that there's uh, significant amount of uh, fluid collection and subperiosteal abscess through this area. So subperiosteal abscess of the humerus is going to be the answer you're looking for. Okay, nine-year-old boy is treated for acute hematogenous osteomyelitis of the distal tibia. Um, he uh, fails to show any clinical improvement with IV uh, therapy. Advanced imaging is obtained that shows a 1.5 by 1.5 abscess. A following uh, surgery, serial evaluations of which of the following studies is most expeditious method to determine the early success of treatment. We have options of white blood cell count, MRI, ESR, CRP, and radiographs. Again, um, your uh, CRP is typically your most sensitive uh, marker here uh, in terms of plotting the response, as well as detecting the um, infection initially. So our operative uh, treatment is going to be uh, surgical. Um, drainage, debridement, and antibiotic uh, therapy, um, and uh, oftentimes the institutions will develop an algorithm treatment for this. We say a contraindication um, uh, to a surgical drainage is hemodynamic instability, but keep in mind if what's really making them hemodynamically unstable is the fact they're getting septic, then what you don't want to do is wait on going to the OR. In fact, you want to run there. Um, and so just uh, keep that in mind. Sometimes they're hemodynamically unstable for other reasons, um, but if it seems like it's uh, related to the sepsis, which most commonly it's going to be in the setting, uh, then you want to probably pick up the pace so that you can uh, start getting the infection under the con under control. Um, this uh, article in JBJS uh, just advocated for evidence-based treatment guidelines with a multidisciplinary team approach. You want to evacuate all purulents, remove the sequestrum in chronic cases, um, and then uh, close the wound either over drains or oftentimes we'll use a wound vac uh, to try and clean everything uh, out really nicely and uh, go back in a staged manner for closure. And then you follow with IV antibiotics, and once their ESR and CRP are normalized, um, we can uh, usually switch to PO antibiotics. Again, um, think about if you're getting uh, culture specimens, sending those uh, to pathology as well. Um, and then uh, just to emphasize, um, if it seems like a really bad infection, the best option may be to apply a wound back or pack it rather than uh, closing it right away. DVT is an infrequent complication in children, but the risk factors are uh, being an age over eight, MRSA needing surgical treatment, and CRP greater than six. Meningitis can also occur when you have uh, diffuse infection. Growth disturbances and limb length discrepancies from growth plate involvement are something you have to be uh, cognizant of and follow postoperatively. Be sure to subscribe for more content and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at OrthoBullets.